Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Lori. Sounded, sounded great. Very powerful, very powerful time of worship. Uh, delighted to see everybody this morning, both here and online. My name's Danny Forshee, pastor here at Great Hills Baptist Church. And uh, we are currently in a study in the book of Acts, chapter 22. So you have your Bibles. It'd be wonderful if you could open them up and turn there. And if you uh, maybe have it on your, on your phone or on your uh, computer or on your, uh, you know, this, you know, the, the, uh, hold it in your hand. And uh, we'd love to invite you to join with us as we study God's Word today. And we do welcome you online. God bless you. I'm reminded uh, often how many of you are online participating with us, worshiping the Lord, not only Sunday morning, but also uh, Wednesday nights as our prayer ministry expands and across the nation, different people join in with us. They submit their prayer requests, and it's an honor uh, to pray with you uh, on that hour of prayer on Wednesday. And so we've been praying on Wednesday night before the Sunday service for the text, for the service that God would really speak to you and encourage you today. And uh, we're delighted that you're here. And I know that, as Jeff mentioned there, you know, there's a lot of joy in the room, but there's also a lot of sadness. Um, and I want to go ahead and mention this, because this is on my heart, and I know uh, this impacts some of you were in the, the Great Hall on Friday uh, when there was a, a funeral service being held, and Marcus Groudon, who was only 58 years of age, uh, he collapsed there in the Great Hall, and uh, he subsequently died, and so we think about him and his uh, family, his mom, Velma, and so we're praying for them, and it's always uh, such, a, such a hard time. A funeral's a hard time. Anyhow, I preached a funeral yesterday in the Great Hall, and uh, so nothing like that happened, and I'm grateful, but I'm sorry for those of you that were there. It's very traumatic if you've never seen that. I have somebody collapse. You have to do CPR on them, and so uh, we're praying for them and, and, and their family. Um, yeah, it's hard, really hard. So Acts chapter 22, we're going to read God's Word. We're going to receive nourishment and strength from the Holy Spirit as we uh, study together, as we read God's Word together, and we're very, very glad that you're here, that God has so ordained that you could be here for such a time as this. The title of our message is Calmness Under Pressure, How to Remain Calm When Everything Else Just Seems to Be Unraveling Around You. How can you and I have the spiritual capacity and wherewithal to be able to withstand, or maybe even as Paul said in Ephesians 6, just to stand in the midst of your trial, your temptation, your difficulty. And the Apostle Paul is exhibit A for this. He is such a, a beautiful example of what it means for someone to have everything just kind of falling apart uh, around them, but they have that spiritual ability uh, to trust in God. And I tell you, and I'm gonna share this at the end of the message, but the way Paul stands for the Lord in his hour of trial is because he had been walking with God for so long. And so many times you see people who, who are Christians and they just fall away. At the moment of trial, of difficulty, of death or divorce or tragedy, they, their faith was not very deep. And, uh, and Jesus said, look, the winds are gonna come and they're gonna howl upon your foundation of your life. And if your life is deeply rooted upon the person of Jesus Christ and you have a walk with him, a vibrant walk with him, when you're in fellowship with him, with the body of Christ, the church, as hard as it may be, it will not topple you over. You will be able to stand. But if your faith is very weak or if your faith is on people, you know, and if it's not deeply rooted in the Lord, when those winds of difficulty and adversity come, uh, they will topple you over. But today we get to study about a guy who's like, man, his faith is stalwart He's so utterly uh, dependent on the Lord in the good times and the bad times. So I'll go ahead and read the text as the Apostle Paul is there in Jerusalem about AD 57. He has finished his third missionary journey. He has come to the home base. He has come to the mother church in Jerusalem. And James and the other uh, apostles and disciples had told Paul, look, uh, Paul, we welcome you, but we've also heard lots of things about you. There's lots of rumors about you. We've heard that you're anti-Jewish, that you are not for Moses and the temple and the law anymore. And so what we'd like for you to do is to go into the temple and to demonstrate to everybody that, yes, even though you're an ardent, devout follower of Jesus, that you are not dismissing Judaism. You still, you still believe in the law and in the importance of Moses and Elijah and the prophets and all of that. And Paul said, well, sure, I'll be, I'll be happy to do that. And so he goes into the temple, and when he gets into the temple, 
the Jewish people who are, uh, they're very, it's Pentecost and they're, they're excited and they hear the rumors about Paul that Paul was uh, against the temple and against the law. It was not true. It was not true. But they, you know, how, you know how people like to gossip. You know how word gets out. And so they didn't take the time to research it. They just believed it. And so when they saw him, they physically laid hands on him. And they began to beat him. And so a man by the name of uh, Claudius Lysias, he is the commander of the troops there in Jerusalem. He has a cohort. He has at least a couple of hundred people underneath him. And so they go into the temple precinct and they extract Paul from those who are trying to take his life. And so they pull him out of there and they're taking him up to Antonio Fortress where they're going to incarcerate him. And before he is put there into prison, he asks the commander, would you allow me to speak to these people? They're my people. I know they hate me, but they don't understand where I've been and what I've been doing. Would you allow me to share with them? And so he says, sure, go ahead and share. And last week we looked at that. We looked at Paul's life before he met Christ. And then we looked at how he met Christ. And then he was trying to share with them what God has been doing in his life. But he used the G word. Oh, goodness. That's the word you don't use at the Feast of Pentecost with Jews who are not believers in Jesus Christ. Now, these, these people are... Uh, they're ardent followers of, of Judaism, but, but they have misunderstood Paul, and they're ready to rip him apart. Now, I will say, it doesn't matter what religion you are. If you're not careful, you can come up against people that disagree with you, and you can get downright ugly. You can get mean-spirited, and it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew, a, a Christian, or a Muslim. It doesn't matter what your religion is, but if if you get to the point where you can't talk to somebody because they look different or they believe different or they act different, then I don't know about the other religions, but I know this for sure, that is not becoming for a child of God, a, a, a true follower of Jesus Christ who turned the other cheek, who was crucified on a cross to give us an example of great calmness under pressure. And so Paul's going to exhibit this for us. He shares his testimony and they listen to him. Until this word, and then they raised their voices and they said, away with him. Now, not, that's putting it lightly. It's very uh, derogatory, very pejorative when they said, away with such a fellow from the earth. Get rid of him, for he is not fit to live. Y'all were saying, well, what in the world did Paul say? What was so, I mean, what, what was so explosive? He used the word Gentiles, literally that I have been ministering to Gentiles, and they just lost it. They cried out. They tore off their clothes. They threw dust in the air. And so the commander, and this is Claudius Lysias, the commander, he leads the troops in for Rome to keep Jerusalem in order. He ordered Paul to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging. Now, I want, you, I want you to just grasp that word for just a moment. That scourging is almost a death sentence. Many people never survived. Jesus barely survived that very same treatment 27 years prior in the same city at the hands of the same people, the Romans, the Jewish people propelling it and the Romans uh, executing it. And so they are going to beat him within an inch of his life to extract some kind of testimony because Claudius Lysias is like, I know you're not the, the Greek zealot that I thought you were, but who are you? You've spoken the Aramaic language. These people are in an uproar. I don't know what you just said because I speak Greek. I don't know what you just said to these people, but surely there's something wrong with you and we're gonna beat you and we're gonna get it out of you so that he might know why they shouted so against him. And then they bound Paul with thongs. Now, these are leather straps and if you can... Imagine there's a stump, there's a, a wooden stump, and they're going to tie his hands to his ankles. And if you'll notice my back, how exposed my back is, and that's when they're going to beat him with a flagellum. And those thongs at the end of it, they're going to be metal, there's going to be bone. And when they land that into his back and they pull it out, it's going to give him excruciating pain. And surely then he'll tell the truth, right? Right? I mean, he, he's got to confess what is going on that these people are ready to kill him. Now, I want to show you some calmness under pressure. And when they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful 
for you to scourge a man who is a Roman. I am a Roman and I'm uncondemned. And when the centurion heard that, he went and he told the commander, he told Claudius Lysias, he said, man, take care, whatever you do, take care of this guy because this man is a Roman. Now, when the commander came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, yes. The commander answered with a large sum, I obtained my citizenship. And Paul said, oh, good night, uh, but I was born a citizen. Then immediately, those who were about to examine him, you with me, examine, scourging with the flagellum, beating him with an inch of his life, they, they stopped and they withdrew from him and the commander was so afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. Calmness under pressure. I'm just about finished with John Patton's uh, biography. It is a fascinating read of a missionary in the Hebrides, the New Hebrides Islands. Um, some of you, I mentioned this last week, and y'all were asking me, well, where is this place? On the map, uh, Vanuatu. Vanuatu is the place today. They used to be called the New Hebrides. I don't know if we got, we put the picture on the screen. I'll try to, I'll, I'll circle it for you and, and show it to you. Okay, so this is uh, Australia. Can y'all see that? And this is Papua New Guinea, Indonesia. Right over here is um, New Zealand. And so right here is, you see how remote and distant this is? Vanuatu right here. And right here, you can't see it, but it literally says New Hebrides. And so this is where missionary John Patton went. He was from Scotland and he planted his whole life right here among these tribal, cannibalistic, heathenistic, paganistic people. And he documents in his book, I'm telling you, I can hardly put this book down because he talks about how many times they tried to kill him because they were going to eat him. I don't know about you, but that just scares the eebie out of me that somebody not only wants to kill me, but now they want to have me for dinner, for heaven's sake. And he knows that when he goes to minister to the New Hebrides and he plants his life there. His wife dies. His son dies. He goes and raises money in Australia, New Zealand. He comes back. He remarries and he plants his life there. And he, he has story after story. I'm just going to give you two incidents. And this is happening throughout his ministry in the 1800s. A man furiously rushed on me with his axe. Are y'all okay? Are y'all, this is just unbelievable. He came at me with his axe, but another chief snatched a spade with which I had been working and dexterously defended me from instant death. Life in such circumstances led me to cling very near to the Lord Jesus. Can we say amen to that? I knew not for one brief hour when or how another attack might be made. And yet, with my hand clasped in the hand once nailed at Calvary, and now away, away in the scepter of the universe, calmness and peace and resignation abode in my soul. Next day, <laughs> next day, a wild chief, he, this fellow followed me for four hours. He loaded his musket and though often with directed it towards me, God restrained his hand, and I spoke kindly to him. I spoke kindly to him and attended to my work as if he had not been there, fully persuaded that my God had placed me there and would protect me till my allotted task was finished. Looking up in unceasing prayer to our dear Lord Jesus, I left it all in his hands, and I felt immortal till my work was done. Mercy. Heroes, heroes of the faith. What, what can we learn from these precious and godly men and women who are so composed, have such spiritual capacity and wherewithal? So my point for us, Great Hills, is this. If they can withstand that kind of pressure, then surely when you and I are tempted, when you and I are tempted to say something or do something, that we also can have that same kind of spiritual composure to respond in a way that brings glory to God and expands the kingdom of God and our witness for Christ. So there are a few things here in this text I want to walk you through and, and look at with you. The first one is Paul's reaction. 
And so I've read the text, but now I wanna just kind of walk you through it because there's so much going on here. Uh, the reaction of, of the jaded crowd of Jews, they were gathered at the temple during the Feast of Pentecost. They summarily dismissed Paul's testimony. He had not done any of the things that they had accused him of doing. He really had not. They said, well, you brought Trophimus, the Gentile, from Asia, you brought him into the temple. He said, no, I did not. You saw me in the streets walking with him, but you assumed that surely I brought him into the court of the Jewish women, but I, I did not. Verse 21, when he used that word Gentile, Chuck Swindoll, in his inimitable way, explains what happened when Paul said the word. Did he say Gentiles? Yes, the man used the G word. Boom, that's all the volatile crowd needed to hear. What an explosion. They had heard enough. This man is now concerned about Gentiles. We don't talk to Gentiles. We don't relate to Gentiles. Our children do not go to school with Gentiles. We refuse to live among Gentiles. Gentiles were like a pack of wild dogs. And that's all it took. And the place erupted in dust. It's hard for us to appreciate and to understand the, just how volatile it was and just how deep the hatred was back then. Um, it, it's hard for us to understand, and it's even harder for me to understand when, when people claim, a certain, or claim any kind of religion, but their religion doesn't lead them to forgive and to love and to pardon, but their religion they feel empowered to hate and to even annihilate. I remember 2018, a group of you went with us to, uh, to Israel. I had not been to Bethlehem. I wanted so badly to go to Bethlehem. I talked to the tour and they, uh, the tour owner, and he says, you, you can go, but I could tell something in his voice like, but what? He said, but your Jewish guide will not be able to go with you to Bethlehem. And we were like, well, well, well why not? And they're like, well, you just don't understand. It's, it's still pretty, pretty raw. There's a lot of hatred between the Arabs and the Jews and uh, and, and so your, your tour guide, even though she's a believer in Christ, she, she's still very much a, a Jew. And so I was saddened by that. We got on the, sh got on the uh, I almost said the ship. We got on the, the, what do you call the big things? You're on the bus, thank you. We got on the bus, and as we were driving into Bethlehem, our, um, our bus driver, uh, Malar, he, uh, uh, it was Pilar, and oh, I pray for him. It'll come to me in just a minute. He, he was Arab background. He could drive into Bethlehem, and there was a sign, a conspicuous sign. You remember it, Ashley? It was right there on the highway. It says, if you are a Jew, do not come into our city. I mean, it was a threat. D do not come into this city. In Paul's day, in the temple precinct, there, there was the court of, of, of the Gentiles, which they could come and mingle around on the outside. But if you go through the barrier and you enter into the court of the Jewish women, you had to be uh, a, a Jew, uh, male or female. And then the males could go to the next level, which the, the, a different court. Then you eventually get in the court of the priest and the court of the high priest and to the holy of holies. But they found this uh, inscription. They found it in, in, uh, and it's written in Greek in the 1800s, and it literally read, no foreigner, now this is into the temple in Paul's day. It had a sign, it said, no foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the temple and enclosure. Now check this out. Anyone who is caught trespassing will bear personal responsibility for his ensuing death. If a Jewish person were to travel to another country, a Gentile country, and come back to Jerusalem, then he had to go through some purifying, ritual cleansing uh, just, to, just to come back into the fold. So for a Gentile to claim, and Paul was claiming this, that Gentiles now have come into a covenant relationship with Almighty God. Oh my word, it was more than they could possibly stand. And they said, away with him, away with him. Their racial bigotry and hatred was so deep, they could never appreciate the fact that Paul had been intermingling with and sharing with these people, the dreaded G people, the Gentiles. So they tore their clothing. I don't know if you saw how demonstrative that was. They're throwing their clothes. They're throwing dust in the air. One writer said, they screamed and gesticulated in a riot of abandoned rage. 
So I had to look up gesticulated, and it means to have gestures in an animated manner. And so they are just like losing their ever-loving minds. Why? Because Paul has given his life to Christ, and now he is out witnessing uh, to people who are different than his own. I don't know if you've shared your faith lately, um, but if you share your faith frequently, you, you're going to bump into this resistance. Now, it may not be somebody that will physically lay hands on you, but you will get that look, you will get that attitude, you will get that resistance. And, and I, I can only say it's just, it's just born from the, just from hell itself. There's just this this hatred that comes across if you, it's not the G word, it's the J word. Y'all with me? You know what Brett Hume, a commentator, said? The two most explosive words in the English language are Jesus Christ. This is a true story. I can't make this up. A few years ago, I flew into College Station. I was speaking to a lot of Texas A&M students. And... Um, Central Baptist Church, Ross, uh, where Wes was on staff. And uh, I don't think Wes was there at the time. This is a few years ago. And so I went and they invited me and they put me up in the Hilton, uh, what is it, the Garden Inn there in College Station. And, and they said, you know, we want you to speak to a lot of college students and talk to them about evangelism and sharing your faith. And I said, man, I'm honored to do that. And so I did, had a great meeting. The next morning, I get up before I get on my flight to fly out, I get up and I go to, the, uh, go to the gym and I do my little workout and when I come back upstairs and I'm going to my room, I start smelling smoke and uh, I start hearing alarms and, and things are, are happening and I was like, this, this looks like this place is on fire. And then I looked at the two ladies working the front desk and they were starting to panic and they're like, there's a fire that has broken out in, in this back room here and it, the smoke is coming out. And, and one of the ladies, she said, call 911. And so the lady's calling 911. I'm, I'm looking there, I'm sweating. I'm like, ma'am, look, there are people downstairs. They're, they are working out. They have their headphones on. They're watching their, they say, go, tell them, tell them. I was like, is this really happening? You know, is this happening? So I take off and I run and that man and that woman, they're, they're doing their little, y'all with me? Doing their treadmill. And they're looking up at the screen. And I, I tap them on the shoulder. I said, sir, sir. And I said, ma'am, ma'am. And it startled them. And they looked at me. They're like, what? What's going on? I said, there's a fire. It's upstairs. But the, the, we're, we're concerned about this. You, you need to get out. And man, they looked at me like they were going to kill me. They were like, <sighs> like, why are you interrupting me? You know, I mean, I'm working. I said, dude, there's a fire in this house. You, and I said, I, I warned you, I'm telling you. And I took off and I, I ran outside. Everybody's outside and it's cold. And, and woo, 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 here come the police. Here come, do it again. Woo, woo, woo. Here come the ambulance and here come the fire truck. And it's, and it's dramatic. And I thought about that. That's a lot the way it is when you witness to people. There's a hell, there's a fire there's a lostness to be avoided. And I, I want to I help you. I don't want to tell you about Christ. And they look at you like, you're wasting my time. I, I don't want to hear this. Well, if you can multiply that exponentially, that's, that's what Paul's experiencing. And, and, and this hatred, I mean, this is getting to the point of shedding blood. And this is the reaction of the people. Number two is the interrogation. Here it comes. The commander is about to have Paul examined through scourging. Uh, he, he, he's concluded Paul must be guilty of some terrible crime, right? I mean, why else would these people throw their clothes, rip off their clothes for heaven's sake, throw clothes and dust and shout and scream and gesticulate, all right? My new word I learned for the day. And why are they doing that? This guy has to be what? He's gotta be guilty. So the scourging, as I mentioned earlier, it would be a flagellum with a wooden handle, leather, they call them thongs, leather bands, strips of leather. And attached to them would be pieces of metal and bone. They would take it, they would thrust it into the back, and Paul knows what this, what's going to happen. And then they would pull out and, and thrust it again. And like I said, most people died through loss of blood. They, they just didn't make it. Again, 27 years prior, that's exactly what happened to Jesus. 
So the commander believes, I'm gonna extract a confession of wrongdoing. He stretches Paul out over that stump. His hands, his ankles are, are tied together and he's about to be beaten. I was reminded, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25, he said, you know, hardship, I'm, I'm well acquainted with it. 20, verse 24 says, from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I have been in the deep. And when you research Paul's life, all of this comes, most of it, let me say, comes at the hands of religious, zealot Jewish people who hated him and hated what he uh, stood for. Now, some of it, like in Ephesus, some of the Ephesian Gentile people were persecuting Paul, but mostly it was the Jewish people. And so number three is the interaction. Here's what comes after this interrogation. In these verses, we're gonna see Paul's amazing composure. He's going to have, um, he's going to have tremendous spiritual maturity, far more than I could ever imagine. Verse 25, he, he says, is it lawful for what you are about to do to me? You see, the Valerian and Portion Roman laws stipulated very clearly if you are a Roman citizen, look, watch this. You, you cannot even be tied. You, you, you cannot be incarcerated. You cannot be condemned if you are a Roman citizen unless you had gone through a court of trial. And so this had all had been expedited. I mean, none of this had happened to Paul. He had no trial. He was just assumed guilty. He more than just incarcerated. I mean, he is bound hand and foot and ankles. His back is exposed and he is about to be beaten. So verse 26, uh, the centurion who is over 100 soldiers um, looked at Paul and Paul says, uh, you know, do, do you understand who, who I am? That I am a, a Roman citizen. At that moment, um, one, one writer says, Paul did not look like a dignified Roman citizen. In fact, he was battered and very uh, undignified. Another writer said, but isn't this amazing that Paul, uh, is that straight thinking under pressure or what? To be able to, to have that ability to be able to go, okay, wait a minute. I am a Roman citizen and I'm gonna appeal to my citizenship. There are two ways, church, that you could become a, a Roman citizen. It was either through bribery or through birth, okay? Claudius Lysias, the emperor of Rome at this time, so I thought this was very interesting, is a man by the name of, of Claudius, Emperor Claudius. M many people believe that Claudius Lysias, the Roman commander, is a pretty big job over the, the Jewish, uh, over Jerusalem, they believed that he bribed and paid his way in order to obtain his Roman citizenship. And that's when he said, well, Paul, I have my Roman citizenship. I've paid for it. How about you? But Paul said, and this is much heavier, it's much more important when he said, but I was born this way. And for Paul to have been born a Roman citizen, one of two things had to happen. And here's what had to happen. Somebody, either his father or his grandfather, had to have served in some valuable way to a Roman general or a Roman administrator. And so either by bribery or by birth, and the one that carries the more weight, especially in a court of law, it would be by birth. So in verse 29, immediately, they backed away from Paul. They, by the way, had they beaten him, some of y'all are like, you're giving me way much more uh, history than I, than I can hand, I handle, but, but it's fascinating to me that had they laid one stripe on his back, one of two things would have happened. Claudius Lysias, at best, he would have lost his job. He would have been terminated. At worst, and this is probably what would have happened, he would have been executed because he had thrust his hand or he gave the command to have a Roman citizen be. I don't know about y'all, but I'm just like, Paul, you go, man. That's amazing. I'd probably pass out, at least freak out, not I'd forget who I was, forget my name, and there Paul is going, he's just so composed, and he just says, hold on just a second. Before you do this to me, you need to know 
So I want to give you some takeaways. This is something I want to close my message with. How, how, can, how can this story, true story, help you and me today? There are four things. Number one, uh, when, when you're in a pressure situation, remember the sovereignty of God. That's what I would encourage you with. If you're in a situation where you, you just feel like, I'm, I don't know what I'm gonna do, I'm freaking out, I'm, I'm about to pass out, I, I, just remember this, the sovereignty of God. The will of God will never take you where the power of God will not sustain you. You with me? The, the will of God is not gonna take you to a place. See, Paul, that the, 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 the Spirit of God will not sustain you. Paul already knew this was gonna happen. He had been told in Acts chapter 20, verse 33, the Holy Spirit has warned me, chains and tribulations await me. Acts 21, 13, Paul said, I'm already ready to die in Jerusalem if need be. But here's the thing. This is what the missionary, uh, James Patton, says over and over and over in his, in his uh, biography, autobiography. He says, you know, I had so many close encounters with death but I had resolved in my heart. I said, one of two things is gonna happen. I hope you're listening. This is gonna help you. This is gonna help you, especially when you and I approach our darkest days. One of two things is gonna happen. You are a child of God. Let's say you are a child of God. God is either going to deliver you or he's going to deliver you. You with me? He's either gonna remove you from the situation, save your life, and you live to fight another day, live to live another day, or he's gonna say, come on home. It is time. And so either way, you, W, I, and you win. You win. So I would remember the sovereignty of God. Number two, let's prepare for those days. I call them prepare for days of war in times of peace. Proverbs 17, three says, the refining pot is for silver and the furnace is for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts of his children. All of us gotta walk this path. Uh, unless Jesus comes, or unless you're, you're taken quickly in an accident. Um, But when you pray daily, and when you read your Bible, and when you share your faith, and you gather with God's people, and you don't allow bitterness or offense to take deep root in your heart, but you, you constantly are forgiving and being forgiven, what, what I'm finding in 40 years of doing this, 40 years of pastoring and preaching and teaching, I, I'm seeing that those who have the foundation, and those who have lived for Christ and lived well, they die well. They die well. They're under pressure, and they're under the gun, if you will, but they're like, you know what? The, my spiritual roots have run deep. I'm not perfect, but I'm experiencing the supernatural peace of God. I've prepared for this day. Now, let's not just talk about death. Let's talk about, let's talk about some hard times that we face, whether it's, you know, if you don't if you don't let this faith Christianity thing go, it's gonna cost you. It's gonna cost you your job, it's gonna cost you your raise and so forth. How, how are you gonna withstand that? I, I believe you can withstand it if, if you are following the Lord and you're, you're deep in your walk with God. And unfortunately, there's such a massive falling away. I, I can't tell you how many times people say, well, I used to go to church, and, but, you, but, but God didn't come through for me, and so I'm mad at him, and I'm never gonna serve him again. And I'm just like, it, it's such a shallow, such a shallow faith. Number three, use hard circumstances as a platform to share Christ. That's something that I'm taking away from this story. Use these hard circumstances as a platform to share your faith. And Paul did that so wonderfully well. And then finally, when the time comes, speak the truth in love. Paul speaks to his Jewish countrymen. He's up there on the Antonio Fortress. He's looking out over the steps and they're, they're going crazy, and he's speaking to them calmly, and he speaks to uh, the commander and the centurion. He speaks the truth of God in love. And, and what's beautiful to me is, is, is the things Paul doesn't do. You don't sense the, the revenge and the, the anger, and you don't, the retaliation. You just sense that Paul is resolved. He is, he is at peace with God, and he is like, God, my life is yours, and um, I'm gonna trust you in this and I'm gonna, I'm gonna bear witness for you, Lord, even in this crucible. 
even in this dark, hard crucible. Some of you are looking at me like, wow, man, I wish I had that. I wish I had that kind of faith. I, I know me, man. Somebody crosses me, I'm going to give them five of these where they sneeze, man. I ain't messing around, man. I'm telling you, I'm bringing it, man. I, and, and that's so unlike Christ. Turn the other cheek. Bear that burden. Share your faith. Forgive. I think, I think that would be a whole lot more attractive than you retaliating. You say, well, how do I get that? Well, if you know Jesus, you already got it. <laughs> it's just you got you to get deep. You got to get grounded. This is why I preach the Bible, y'all. One of my staff said, you know, texting thread, they said, we've been in Acts for four years. I'm good. I'm good as long as she, he, it's the Bible. To which I would say, that's all I got. <laughs> that's all I got is the Bible. I'm gonna preach the Bible because I know your day's coming and it's, it's, gonna, be, it's gonna be hard. But if you're firmly rooted in the faith, y'all, I'm preaching to me. I don't know about y'all, when y'all preach, y'all remember when y'all preach and y'all got them fingers pointing at people? Look at all the fingers pointing back at you, you know? They're pointing back at me. What am I gonna do when the pressure comes? I hope that I'm ready and I'm wanting to, wanting to help you get ready. Father, we thank you for your word. It is amazing, God. It's preserved, it's awesome. And we're asking you, Lord, to just just, just put the seed of the gospel and the sanctification of Christ just deep within our, our soil, Lord. And I pray that it just takes great root and, and as we read earlier, Lord, it would produce great fruit as we abide in you, Lord. We abide in you um, because, Lord, you really are all we've got and your word is all we have and, Lord, that's all we need and that's all I wanna preach. That's all I wanna do is to Lead your people, Lord, to know you and to walk with you, especially in the hard times. Father, we pray for those with us today, Lord, whether they're online or whether they're in this room, and Lord, they would be honest and they would say, I don't have that. I don't have that spiritual capital, that spiritual wherewithal. That's why I fly off at the handle. That's why I have no self-control, no victory over temptation. It could very well be you just don't have Christ. And we're gonna invite you to receive the Lord, repent of your sins, be born again, allow the Holy Spirit of God to do his work in you and, and accept him as your Lord and Savior. I'm praying for you right now. I'm praying that God would soften your heart and that you would receive him into your heart even, even now. Would you do that? Would you be honest? Would you be open? And would you say, Lord, it's me. I'm, I'm needing to give me my life today. We would receive you, we would rejoice with you, and then we would want to help you and, 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 and see you discipled and encouraged in the things of God. So Father, we pray in today, Lord, excited for people to give their lives to you and also excited to see our, our church, Lord, grounded and, and firmly planted deep within the nutrients of the Word of God. Lord, help us to soak it all up. Lord, how much longer do we have? How much longer do we have that we could be able to do this, Lord, to do this freely and and to train and to get ready to prepare for the day of days, those days that are coming for us all. So help us, Lord, to be ready. Help us to rejoice and help us, Lord, to prepare. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to ask you to stand as we have our invitation at this time. If you want to come to the altar and pray, if you want to ask someone to pray with you, pray for you, that's why we're here. We'd love to encourage you. You want to give your life to Christ? Come on. We'll do that with you as well. We'll help you any way we can. God bless you as you come.